Hey, kia ora everyone. Um, I've got some notes here, so if you see me looking down, uh, that's probably why. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining me today. Uh, and I'm going to be giving a talk today on creating reactive art or, you know, creating art when the world is collapsing around you. Uh, and I just want to start saying thanks for Game for Change for letting me uh, talk today. Uh, so thank you. Um, before I begin, I just want to start with uh, an acknowledgement of country. Um, I just want to acknowledge and pay respects to Bunjalung people, which is where I uh, conduct my business and do my work. And that's where I'm giving this talk today. Um, so yeah, I just want to pay respects to elders past and present. Right, uh, just before we get in, uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of like a language or content warning here because uh, the reality of this game is it talks a little bit about fascism and the sort of uh, atrocities committed in that. And so I think, uh, you know, to do that justice, um, you can't really dumb that down. You've got to really talk about it and not let it slide uh, because unfortunately that seems to be, uh, you know, a problem there. So if, you know, younger viewers maybe skip this one or, you know, go grab a Milo or something. Um, but anyway, maybe we should just start with uh, me. Um, my name is um, Naftali Faulkner. I'm a Naitarangi man living in Australia. And, um, you know, I, I, my background when it comes to games is I've only really been in the games industry for a little under two years now. Um, so I'd like to say I'm not really an expert on the sort of uh, behind the scenes of making games. But my background in study and stuff like this, uh, sort of before coming into this industry, was sort of in a university space. Uh, and that was looking, you know, at the sort of uh, two fields, I guess. One was design and the other was uh, the sort of emerging field of Indigenous knowledge, um, which we'll get to in the presentation. Um, and so I just want to sort of acknowledge that sort of these are my biases going in. Um, so you can sort of know where I'm coming from with this. Uh, so... Uh, I'm just going to give you a little overview of the next 20 minutes so you can sort of know where I'm going to be uh, talking about stuff. The first thing we're going to talk about is um, all that evil university uh, postmodern neo-Marxist jargon or whatever you want to call it. Uh, just to start with giving a sort of foundation to what we'll be talking about when we're talking about, you know, the Morangi generation's sort of antagonist and the DLC, which was very reactive to 2020. And then as well as um, some advice I'm going to give to other developers if they want to sort of follow in the same uh, footsteps as this game, or they want to sort of make games that are similar to this. As I said, I'm not really an expert of the game side, but you can at least know where I was coming from with this. Uh, and when it came to sort of talking about these uh, more, I guess, academic topics, um, you can sort of maybe follow this advice and see how it goes for you. So throughout the presentation, uh, there'll be some QR codes uh, on screen. And that's just, if you sort of, want to know more about what I'm talking about in this first part, you can just scan those and you should be able to sort of go to a link and start reading. Uh, I just tried to pick uh, very entry level readings uh, just in case you don't really know what I'm uh, talking about, but you want to sort of go a little bit further into that. So yeah, onto the uh, evil postmodern neo-Marxist stuff, which is destroying America, which is uh, otherwise known as, you know, basic academic critiques and critical thinking skills. Um, you know, and the, the reason I joke about that is this idea that games are political um, is total rubbish, really, or this idea that um, politics is, is is somewhat detrimental to games. It's, it's silly. I mean, I guess the thing I kind of think about is like, you know, my existence is political, so there's no really getting around that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, as I said, I worked at universities and this stuff's not really debated. This is This is very... Uh, introductory stuff and um, I'd encourage everyone to go read it if you've got some spare time. Uh, but you might be wondering, why would you make games like this? You know, why would you want to make uh, these, you know, so-called political games or games that tackle these kind of uh, topics? You know, you've probably heard uh, some rant, uh, you know, say something about this in the past and they probably had uh, a bunch of points like about how uh, you, you know, get woke or go broke and all this other nonsense. Um, I can think of a couple of reasons. Um, one of the first is that there are actually certain game developers in the world um, that live in nation states that can't criticize their government. And if they do, they'll be locked up in prison and they will be, you know, completely uh, punished for expressing that, you know, political critique. 
And so if you are able to do it, you should maybe consider using that advantage because it is an advantage to be able to do that. You have political or, uh, you know, creative freedom to actually go and um, create these kind of works without having to worry about, um, you know, being locked up in prison. And even if you attract some kind of attention from, uh, you know, uh, media sources or something like that, that's great for you. You've got, you've got some, um, you know, uh, free advertising. Uh, the other reason I would say is that, you know, this idea of political art always becomes a time capsule of when it was made. You know, if you think about any um, boomer rock music from the 60s that was about, you know, the Vietnam War or the civil rights era, it is basically a, um, you know, a, a timeless piece that people look back on and study. <clears throat> I would also say that when you do this right, uh, they become really hard hitting um you know, works that you can sort of uh, really challenge what's sort of going on in the space. The other reasons I would say is that, you know, if you want this idea of the center or the normal uh, game to sort of move in that direction, um, you've got to start pushing against the boundary so that that starts to be this space where um, these kind of works are just accepted as the norm. And, you know, an example of that would be that, you know, 10 years ago, it was probably unthinkable that a, um, you know, video game would have an LGBT character in it. And now uh, it's the kind of thing where it's very normalized and the sort of uh, critiques of that or angry outrage is, is non-existent because that stuff gets old quickly, doesn't it? Um, and then the last one I would say is that there is actually a market for people who enjoy this kind of stuff. Um, you know, they're not like man children looking at games as uh you know toys where that's where this uh, industry comes from you know if you go back and you look at where the games industry's origins lie it is in the toy industry with companies like ljn and activision right and so uh the idea that these games can be uh, works of art rather than products or consumable things um is a thing you can do but i would say that if you are going to do that the, the the audience you will gather has pretty high standards, you know? You can't just say um, capitalism's bad. You have to talk a little bit more about that. You can't, um, that's not the conclusion, that's the starting point. And you need to uh, talk about that a little bit further than the sort of basic critiques. So once you have a little foundation, um, you know, a little academic foundation, uh, to talk about what you should do is take that academic foundation and critique or you know interrogate this fictional world you've created and so i'll explain what the one uh for umurangi generation was the first thing that the um games foundation is based on is this idea of indigenous knowledge right um indigenous knowledge is this idea that it's a different epistemic origin point okay it's a different ontology and it's a different way of being it's not this idea of it being, you know, savage, primitive, or, you know, inferior. Um, it's just different, okay? And the idea around that is to say that Western epistemology comes from, you know, Greek epistemology, right? And the idea is to say that Indigenous epistemologies also have an origin. They're just not as, um, you know, prevalent as the Western one today, because that one is also based on Indigenous epistemology. <clears throat> Um, you know, ontology is that idea of how you perceive reality, right? And for us as Indigenous people, um, that's very different. Um, and that was sort of where with this game, um, it, it started. So I'll go to the next part. The other thing it started to look at was this idea of um, neoliberalism. And so neoliberalism is the backbone of Western political thinking. Um, it's not that idea of it being a, you know, new leftist or, or um, you know, classical leftist or anything like that. It's this idea of it is the backbone that informs all of those things, you know. Uh, when people talk about this idea of, you know, um, freedom or something like that, uh, both left and right believe in freedom. They just have different applications of what they think that looks like, okay. Um, and so when we're talking about neoliberalism, it's the idea that um, it is a critique of uh, former like liberalisms, if that makes sense. So like the first version was um, classical liberalism. The second version was uh, social liberalism. And the third version was, you know, neoliberalism, which is what we see today. 
Um, the next part that the game's sort of based on is this idea of like looking at fascism and the sort of, uh, you know, far right um, political identity that that sort of uh, exists in. And so it's this whole thing about looking at the connection between fascism and neoliberalism where fascism is effectively able to um, live and grow under these neoliberal systems. And what does that look like? Okay. And it's this idea, uh, like what Parenti talks about, this idea of like rational fascism, where basically it's able to exist because it still lies with all of the same assertions that liberalism has. Um, it just has very, very different uh, interpretations of it by the end. So when we're talking about the base game of Umurangi generation, um, this is the idea that, you know, it is a look at what happened in 2019. So I want you to all cast your mind back and try to remember what 2019 was like, all right? So for me, 2019 was where the bushfires destroyed most of Australia and the government didn't do anything about it, right? And so with um, this game, the idea was looking at questions based on what had happened there. And it was about saying, how would the same system that failed Australia in 2019 respond to a kaiju crisis? Okay. And so there's a couple of questions that I thought about, and they were this idea of how does neoliberalism make you comfortable and able to ignore the problems around you while comfortably resting a boot on your head? Okay. What would a cyberpunk future look like if it was based on a mirror of today rather than the 80s? And the third one was how would Maori people continue to survive in a shitty future, right? And so um, the thing I kind of thought about, and this was my sort of big realization between um, this question of political games and um, the idea around it was, I'd rather be you know, accused of being woke than be asleep at the wheel, right? Which means um, I don't actually care if there's this, um, pushback about the game being political anymore because um you know at that point you could stay as a sort of like boring game that's going to not push against anything or you can start to you know tackle this stuff and and dive right in and if you get something wrong that's all right um but it's much more interesting so um the first thing about that was you know neoliberalism is not able to address the problems it creates and that meant in numerangi generation uh, it's in a world where there's a totally avoidable and undeniable crisis event that it's occurred. And here's how the world in that uh, game responded. And so, you know, the idea about that is looking at something like climate change, where the time to act on that was 20 years ago. And we can see really clear examples here in Australia of things like the coral becoming bleached. Um, you know, I believe that there was a study done recently that said it's too late to fix the Great Barrier Reef. It's going to die. That's it. Um, the next part was looking at, you know, we as indigenous people are still here and what do we look like in this future? And the idea around that was to say, you know, this idea of the, you know, dingy cyberpunk shithole that you often see in these, um, you know, worlds, uh, these cyberpunk worlds, that's actually just what we go through a lot of the time, you know, this idea of being completely looked over by the government and, um, all this stuff, that's that's not a future. That's what's happening right now. And then 2020 happened, right? And the same inept system that tried to handle 2019 tried to do 2020. So it was on easy mode and then it went out to ultra violence, right? <laughs> um, and so the idea around that is that we released the macro DLC in 2020. And the idea around that is that, you know, originally we we're going to do something much more positive where it was this idea of, you know, having a, a, you know, level that's that's much more positive about the stuff. But the reality is that after we released the game, George Floyd was murdered next week. And, you know, me and the composer, we had a long chat about how we would do that for, or how we would sort of um, talk about this stuff again. And so the questions asked for the macro DLC is sort of this idea of what's the nature of protesting? You know, what does this comfortable fascism look like? And how does it coexist with this neoliberal system? You know, uh, what do these fascists look like and what do they do when when they think no one's looking? Um, looking at, you know, who are the victims of fascism? 
And then what does anti-fascism entail? And what is uh, the response from fascists, right? So fascism enjoys a level of comfort in neoliberal systems. What does that mean, right? I think it's that idea that, um, you know, we often see this sort of paternalistic take from a lot of these neoliberal systems where when we see, um, you know, fascists storming the capital or, you know, doing a race riot in Charlottesville or something like that, it's, oh, you, you just, they're just a little bit stupid. They don't understand what they're doing. You know, it's this very dumbing down the um, actual, you know, violence of the ideology. And so um, <clears throat> the idea around that is this system allows these things to exist because at the end of the day, fascists are sort of, um, you know, the active agents of these, you know, systems. They're the ones who maintain and uphold a lot of this stuff because, um, the idea of you know upholding a sort of broken system like this that only benefits white people, well, that that that's your um, foot soldier in that war, isn't it? And so the idea around that is having levels in the game that sort of looked at those systems and sort of um, looked at you know the comfort of how this game's fictional universe would enjoy that. And so that was this idea of you know having a gamers palace where you know this sort of fascist rhetoric was right alongside all the games. Uh, and, you know, I'm probably not alone in sort of someone who's played PC gaming before and been in a chat room and seen uh, the kind of things people have said. And you can see that uh, this stuff lines up quite well, doesn't it? Like it's a very comfortable space for fascism to exist in. Um, the next thing was looking about, you know, um, uh, I'll skip this one because I, I believe we're not, oh, hang on, these are jumping around my slides. Uh, okay. Well, but I, for some reason, the slides on my clicker aren't working. There's the skipping one, but that's right. We'll just move to dev advice because I see we've only got a few minutes left. Um, but yeah, my thinking around all this stuff is to give some devs ad advice around how to um, really go about making a so-called political game or, you know, what I did with the Morangi generation. And I think the first thing that you need to do is read academic works. Um, you know, if you've ever heard or you've, or, you know, you've, you've thought of this idea of um, how can I empathize with Indigenous people or how can I um, put your voice in it? Turns out there are actually a lot of Indigenous people who write um, about what we're going through and they write around it really well. And that's, um, you know, the, the brilliance of academics, I guess, is they get paid to summar uh, summarize and synthesize all this information in, in a way that you can sort of easily consume. And that's, uh, you know, usually the sign of a good academic. Um, the next thing is make sure you've got someone to pull you back out because if you're going to be going into this really uh, dark stuff or you're going to be going into these really, um, you know, uh, aggressive places, you want to be able to pull yourself back out so you're not hurt by it at the end. Um, you know, and I'd say that with things like, uh, for me, when I was looking at the DLC for this game, I was looking at, you know, things like genocide and, you know, a lot of the really uh, hateful policy that is still existing today. And I think it's one of those things where being able to be pulled out of that and, um, you know, find ways to deal with it is a, is a really important thing. Uh, the last thing I think, because uh, I, I think we're a bit over time here, um, don't worry about these infantile labels like SJW or Marxist from people who are never going to play your game anyway. Uh, I think there's this, uh, you know, weird assumption that people think that, uh, you know, a lot of the internet hecklers online are listened to in the industry. The reality is they're not. Um, you know, something that was sort of told to me the other day was this idea of the, you know, the idea that that Microsoft and, and all these companies are in competition is quite silly because the reality is Microsoft is a $1 trillion company compared to its next competitor who's down in the billions. Um, you know, there's just this, uh, this 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 silly expectation to have to perform to things like that. And I think um, the reality is that, you know, it's okay to to really push back against that and just go against the grain. Um, I'll say one last thing here, which is slow down if you're new to this. Um, it's probably the most important thing I can say to anyone who's starting to learn um, a new, you know, academic space is. If you're going to start off, you know, kind of as like a baby, just slow down, um, soak it in. And if you're starting to learn, 
um, best thing you should do is get a dictionary so that you can start to understand what's being said um, and grow from there, you know? And if you don't understand it, that's all right. Just go back and, and keep going. So um, that's basically it. Uh, you can follow me here at Selikov or Umurangi game if you just want to look at sort of what the players have been making. Um, and if you do like the game, you should go and buy it, uh, which is available now on Steam and Nintendo Switch. So uh, join me for the Q&A after this. Thank you so much.